Hello everyone. Welcome to the Space Science Webinar Series. Uh, today we have an exciting talk uh, on space weather. Our guest is Dr. Christian Mosel. He is a research associate and a project PI in space weather and heliophysics at the Space Weather Research Institute uh, at the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Uh, broadly speaking, he's an expert on space weather prediction uh, and many other things. He got his PhD in physics from University of Graz. In Austria, uh, he has spent most of his time there. Uh, he was a Marie Curie fellow at uh, UC Berkeley. And uh, he's involved with many of the solar missions. Uh, so Christian, uh, welcome to our center and we look forward to your talk. So I'm handing it over to you. Hello, thanks everyone. Uh, yeah, hello everyone and thanks for the invite. Um, I will talk about today on first results from Solar Orbiter on solar coronal mass ejections. If there are any questions, I think you can also just ask in between. If you'd like, raise your hand on, on Zoom. Um, it's usually not quite, quite nice to have a bit of a discussion also in between. Um, so these are all my co-authors. Um, this is um, mainly done with people from Solar Orbiter and Pepe Colombo. Um, these are the main two missions we are involved with and who yeah, had first data, uh, first data releases in the last few months. Um, so let's just figure out how to go to the next slide. So in general, um, as I think you all know, so space weather, um, consists mainly of um, the solar wind, it's high speed streams and coronal mass ejections. Um, for Earth, it's a quite different environment than for the other planets. Um, only Mercury is kind of comparable to that with its magnetic field. Um, as you see on the left side, it's, at Earth, we have the, the huge problem in, in solar physics that we don't know how to predict the B south or B Z component of the interplanetary magnetic field. So if a magnetic flux rope, as you see here on the left, would impact the Earth, then we would uh, have it difficult to predict um, the magnetic fields at the core uh, of the CME. And these magnetic fields at the core are called magnetic flux ropes. And they have these uh, very neat rotations in the field. And these uh, very coherent structures in the otherwise very turbulent solar wind, so they should be really well predictable, but we can't do that at the moment. Um, and so on the upper right here, you see um, an illustration of the kind of simulations that we do. So we have a toroidal band flux rope model for um, CMEs, uh, which is very fast. I'll come to that later. And we have a, also a very um, computationally efficient background solar wind. And you can see the dots around here. These would be like the positions of, of some uh, spacecraft in the solar wind. Um, on the bottom here, I just wanted to show you. So this would, these are, I think, two very neat plots. Um, we are looking mainly into predicting solar wind and predicting the magnetic effects at Earth. But of course, if you have any solar wind or any solar or any CME model, then you can also predict the solar wind at the other planets. Um, this would be a, a particularly interesting than now with the baby Colombo mission, which arrives at Mercury in 2025. Um, Mercury has a much a uh, weaker magnetic field uh, than Earth, of course. And um, this is, these are just illustrations of the total magnetic field that has been observed by messenger at several positions around Mercury. So you can really see nicely the magnetic field. And for Mars, as uh, you all know, uh, this looks much different because Mars has just uh, like these weak crustal fields, but no global magnetic field. And so the interaction with other planets is of course much different, but we, in our group, we really uh, look into how to predict the interplanetary magnetic, interplanetary magnetic field at the Sun Earth L1 point. And uh, our goal is to also um, try to do that and really be able to do that in real time in the future. So that at one point we can really say in the next uh, half day or day, there will be a CME arriving, which has these kinds of features, these kinds of parameters and that the accuracy of estimating whether it's a hit or not, or uh, if the DSD index will go down to minus 200 or minus 500 or just minus 50 or so. Um, and to predict the Aurora, for instance, for Aurora tourists. 
So these are really our goals that we work on. So I, my, my talk is split in two parts, essentially. In the first part, I will talk about what to expect in SolarCycle 25 and give a bit of an overview of what uh, kind of spacecraft missions we are working with. And in the second part, I will talk about solar orbiter first results. Um, there is a special issue in astronomy and astrophysics current in the, currently in the making. And the deadline for that one is 31st of March uh, this year. So there's a lot of uh, um, uh, work going on at the moment. Um, Solar Orbiter has been essentially designed around those, those four questions. So first, we are looking into more on the, on the left side of the plot. Um, the first big question is how does something like field is generated inside the sun and how does it propagate through the corona outwards into space? Um, and of course, how then this affects space weather. So how do um, flares and CMEs impact the solar system? Uh, we're working really on these uh, two questions. Essentially, we, we are starting with our models, not so much in the corona, but when the CME already left the sun, like at a few solar radii, at the height of a few solar radii, and then how it's, we simulate how it propagates through interplanetary space and then how it impacts the Earth. Um, So this is a movie of uh, Soho Lasco, which I'm pretty sure all of you have seen. I'm not sure if the frame rate is really good if I show it um, through Zoom here, but essentially looking at this, so there's, there has been a long movie released uh, by ESA, I think. Uh, it's on YouTube. You can look at um, all 25 years of uh, Soho Lasco observations. And it's really illustrative to look at, it for, uh, to look at this for a few minutes. Um, because you can really see how the sun is, is behaving. It has, of course, it has these active regions then which throw out a few CMEs at once, then, it will, then it's quiet again for some time. Um, but the cool thing with the stereo mission is, which has been launched in 2006 and which I've been working on like for the last 15 years, uh, that they have these uh, heliospheric imager instruments. And with those heliospheric imagers, we were able to see for the first time how CMEs really would propagate through interplanetary space. Uh, so in this, in this kind of movies, this is from stereo ahead, I think, at the beginning of the mission or a little bit further into the mission in 2010, the sun would be on the right side here and the field of view would start at four degree. Um, you can see a planet moving through here and you can see CMEs very, very well as these kind of wave-like, uh, bulb-like, wave-like structures that propagate uh, every once in a while through the field of view. It's very difficult to work with these data because what you essentially see here is an integrated image um, where um, the sunlight scatters off electrons um, in, in, CME and, in CMEs and in the solar wind. Um, so you, we essentially see solar wind density in, in these images. Um, but with these uh, kind of data, we were able to track for the first time CMEs really through the solar system or through the inner solar system and to see uh, and to better estimate when, when they hit Earth, for instance. Um, so I just um, let this run for a little bit. This is an overview plot now of a few data sources in April, 2020. And so, Solar Orbiter was launched in February 2020, and the magnetometer instrument was uh, switched on in March. And then already on April 20, we saw this really, really great CME lineup event. So CME lineups events are what happens when you have spacecraft um, radially or longitudinal, longitudinally aligned. So they are like within um, a few degrees in longitude for instance, uh, or they're radially not that far separated. Uh, in this case, Solar Orbiter was at about 0 0.8 AU and was just five degrees away from the sun Earth line. And you can see here in the plot so at the bottom, there is, there is the magnetic field of Solar Orbiter. There are the, the three magnetic field components. And the same thing observed for Baby Colombo. And on the upper hand side here, you see uh, the same in wind data. I will come to that uh, a little bit more in detail later, but that's exactly what we want to see uh, with these combined spacecraft. So there are now five spacecraft at the moment. Um, 
flying through the inner solar system that we can use for making these kinds of studies. You can see on the left side, there is a position plot uh, where you can see Parker Solar Probe as a black square. Then there's Solar Orbiter in orange, and then there's Earth on the right side here and Pepe Colombo in blue. There's also Mercury and Venus, but they don't have a uh, space probe that we can use at the moment uh, located there. Uh, very important is also Stereo A, which has been uh, situated here um, at uh, 75 degrees away from, from the Earth. Uh, it has already passed now, I think, um, the Sun Earth L5 point. And this L5 point is, of course, uh, since uh, quite a long time, there's a discussion about that, that we should put a space weather, dedicated space weather mission there uh, because it can stay at that point for a long time without extra fuel. And it can look at um, the Sun Earth line from a side viewpoint. And then we could, we could have these kind of images uh, more or less continuously. So stereo A is now really in that position to, uh, to observe that. And it was in the perfect position to observe uh, the semi in, in April, 2020. I just let this run again. There was also the trajectories um, plotted. And here you can see um, this front here that expands. This is essentially the CME leading edge. Uh, this model is based, uh, this is more like an empirical geometrical model, which is based directly on the, on the heliospheric imager data. And um, by this we can, yeah, we can link exactly when a CME was observed with uh, coronographs or with heliospheric imagers and when it arrives at an in situ spacecraft. And this is a very important problem because this was like um, until the early 2010s, 2010 years, this was really like a huge problem because you never really knew exactly, okay, if there is something, if there is a CME going off at the sun and you see something in situ, you were never really sure how they are connected. Um, but there were a few papers where I was also involved with where we, where we clarified these, these, that these connections are actually okay. So um, I will talk about these observations a bit later. But this is um, now generally an overview plot uh, or an overview movie where you can see again, um, let's just stop this here to explain it first. So this is like pretty much exactly the, the, I think this is today, right? 16th of March, 2021. Um, Earth is now here at the bottom and we have Parker Solar Probe, uh, again in black, with the Colombo in blue and Solar Orbiter in green and with Stereo Head in red. And I just let this run. So what will now happen in the next few years is that there will be a lot of these lineups events. Um, I can just uh, wait a few more seconds and then we come to September, 2021 and October. And here, for instance, we have one of those amazing lineups. Um, here we have Bepi uh, near Mercury then Solar Orbiter is between uh, Stereo A and Earth and Parker Solar Probe is also quite near. So these are also these um, really great opportunities. Um, if, if a CME would go into this direction, then we would really see it at five, maybe up to five points. And then we could really make progress, progress on understanding the CME magnetic structure. Now, the other interesting thing is, of course, what will happen in the upcoming solar cycle. And this is the current situation. So on the bottom plot, you see sunspot number versus time. And the time goes on until the uh, end of uh, 2022. Already at the end of this year, at the end of 2021, you can see that there is a great uh, diverging happening between the official solar cycle forecast or what's deemed an official forecast by NOAA, NASA and ISIS. This has been a forecast that's been published in 2019. And there is a kind of competing forecast that is uh, much, much higher. Okay, and this is done by Scott McIntosh and his co-workers in Boulder. There is a paper on that in 2020. And it's, it's really quite interesting. So you can use um, you know all kinds of, of methods to estimate um, how the next solar cycle is going to look like. So I won't go into this, but this is the kind of situation. Um, I think McIntosh and L have very good arguments um, that if the next solar cycle is gonna be really a, a, a low activity one, 
it's it's probably an outlier based on on some uh, measures of um, solar cycle amplitudes and uh, things like that. Um, uh, you can see you can see the the full uh, solar cycle forecast on the upper side here. So the blue one would be the low official one. The green one would be an average solar cycle since 1750, and this is the Macintosh Odell prediction. So they predict more or less that we would have a cycle like solar cycle 23. And the official NOAA forecast would be that we have a solar cycle like solar cycle 24. Um, but maybe at the end of this year, we should we could see um, which of those predictions come true. There was a, quite a surge at the end of last year in solar activity. So the sunspot number almost went up to 100. Um, this is the, the highest number since I think 2016 or so, or 2017. Um, so and we kind of all expected that now the sunspot number would really, really go up, uh, but it then kind of uh, fell back down again. And now it's getting a little bit more active. So it's it's still not, uh, we can still not decide uh, which of those workers become true, but maybe it will become clearer by, uh, yeah, as, as this year progresses. Um, so looking into the future of what these, these missions will do a little bit more, so Parker Solar Probe um, has been now going down a little bit into uh, this heliocentric distances less than 0 0.1 AU. Um, it will do so even further until the end of the nominal mission in 2025, where it will go down to about 0 0.05 EU. Um, for a long, so I plotted here this um, the heliocentric distance for solar orbiter by the Colombo is at the bottom. This is part of a paper that I had last year in, in APJ, which uh, featured also in a forecast for the uh, in situ CME rates that is observed by these uh, by these missions. And these are the shaded regions behind uh, those plots or in the background of those plots. Um, and essentially we figured out that um, for the upper or for the higher activity prediction, there's about a factor of two. It's about a factor of two higher in the sunspot number. And the same thing is true for the ICME rate. So for the very high prediction, we would see, for instance, in solar maximum in 2025, at Earth about five CMEs per month or one CME every six days on average, which would be the highest such rates uh, since, since the 1990s. Um, so that's also interesting for, for Martian space weather, for instance, because this, is, uh, this, this CME rate is uh, independent of the planet or spacecraft. Uh, these average rates are, they don't depend on, on orbit uh, or spacecraft trajectory. So maybe if we get the, stronger solar cycle now, then we should also see much stronger space weather activity, not only at Earth, but also at, at Mars, for instance. So then something very interesting that we could figure out. So this is now already the first uh, movie of a simulation that we do. Um, this is uh, called, this model is called 3D Core. It's a model which is a bit of an approximation of the physics of a CME flux rope. So there are a few simplifications. So that's the um, simulation is very fast. So we can do like uh, hundreds of thousands of ensemble members if we need them. So here we just uh, made one simulation. Um, but this computational efficiency is, is actually quite important. Uh, what, we, what you see here now is, um, if you look at the simulation, so we put in here a, the Parker Solar Probe trajectory from one of the flybys from 2022. And what you can see here is that um, Parker Solar Probe crosses um, the space close to the sun so fast during these flybys that when you would have seen me approximately impacting PSP uh, when it's, um, when it's uh, near its apex, BSP would then, if the CME would lie more or less uh, with an orientation in the solar equatorial plane, it may cross it in, uh, another time uh, at the legs. And this would be really, really interesting because we don't really know if that magnetic structure that we see here in the simulation is, is actually true. So, um, the signature is that this kind of double encounter or double crossing event, as we call them, 
would produce is, as you see here at the bottom, so you would see this field rotations in flux ropes, which I should probably explain it a little bit later. Um, and you would see a distinct uh, field rotation where one of the components is reversed about a day, about a day later. And so we hope that this happens in reality at some point with the Parker probe mission. So we can really then um, see whether what we model here is true in terms of uh, the, the shape and the magnetic structure and also the propagation of the CV. Uh, so these are, this is essentially a multi-point encounter of a CME uh, by, by one spacecraft, but we need really need those uh, multi-point multi -point encounters in order to make progress. So I'll just skip this. Or maybe I'll, I'll just uh, show you this one here. Now what Solar Orbiter is doing, uh, Parker Solar Probe is of course going very close to the sun, but Solar Orbiter is going to high latitudes. And that's when uh, Solar Orbiter becomes really, really interesting to us. Um, the main goal of that mission is of course to look at the sun's poles. So we can see the solar polar magnetic fields because that's usually the missing ingredient when people try to model the large scale global solar magnetic field. Um, but for us, it's also very interesting, especially when you look at um, times from about middle of 2025 onwards, when uh, solar orbiter will almost go to uh, 20 degrees latitude. And at 20 degrees latitude, it's, um, you can already look down onto the ecliptic to some degree. And then we would also see the, the shape of the CME that, we, uh, that you see here on, on the right side or on the left side or in the middle panel, uh, we, we should see that to some degree um, also with the coronagraphs and heliospheric imagers. Uh, that's, that's a long sought um, solution um, that we saw with stereo because with, with stereo and with all the other spacecraft, it's, you, you run into problems when uh, all the spacecraft and all the imagers and all the situ instruments are all in one plane. If you, if you have one spacecraft that can go out of that plane and either look down onto it or have another in situ point out of that plane, uh, that gives us a lot, a lot new information uh, for modeling CME flux ropes. So this is now a short uh, outlook into the field of what's happening in the next two years. Um, there are Essentially, new missions. Um, first, there is this uh, interplanetary CubeSat, uh, which is called CUSP, which is um, essentially a solar wind monitor with a magnetic field instrument and a uh, solar particle instrument. Um, this will launch on the Artemis 1 mission, um, which I'm pretty sure you've also heard of. This is this uh, new moon program by NASA. And in the first mission, they will launch, I think, 13 CubeSats uh, onto interplanetary. Uh, trajectories and uh, CASP is one of them. So if, if CASP is um, proving that it's it can really sample the solar wind um, with with some degree of accuracy, then it would be really really very interesting for the future. Because I've I've put this here like the green dots and and, and yellow dots. Um, you could place you could build twenty of these and place them in different orbits, and then we would really have a kind of small scale more small scale or mesh or network of, of satellites that can really then look, um, yeah, provide us with those lineups that I talked before and really like see into the CME magnetic structure. And not only that, but also into, you know, high speed streams and all the other uh, large scale heliospheric structures. Then there is a mission called PUNCH, which is a heliospheric imager that will be able to um, use polarized light and this polarized light then gives you a lot better information, uh, 3D information about CME. So, uh, but I won't go into that. Um, then there is Solar Cruiser who will be a um, sub L1 uh, solar sailing demonstration that is, uh, has been selected to launch with IMAP in 2024. So these are already all selected missions. Um, and then, in, in the more far future, like from 2025 onwards, there is a L1 follow-up mission planned. At the moment, there are three spacecraft, Wind Ace and Discover at L1. Um, Discover is mostly used for the real-time solar wind provided per NOAA, uh, but if that has problems, then it's switched to Ace. 
Um, then there is a Finnish um, cube set. It's called For Sale, and um, which is also a kind of technology demonstrate, which should be a kind of technology demonstrator for a solar wind monitor, I think. Um, but the big thing that we are Europe looking forward to is the Lagrange mission, which has not been yet officially selected, but um, it's pushed quite uh, keenly by the UK, especially. And this would then be a really, um, as I talked about, an a mission that will be placed at the Sun Earth L5 point and then will look um, towards the Sun Earth line um, as like an interplanetary space weather station for and should and it should remain there for a longer time. It would also solve some problems because uh, if we look just onto the sun from from the Earth, then we just see um, you know 180 degrees of its surface we make field. And if we would um, get those uh, 60 degrees more by looking from more of the east side uh, of the heliosphere onto the onto the sun, then that would also be very good for um, magnetic models of the uh, of the sun and the solar wind. That would be very helpful. So I now come to the second part of this talk. Um, this is a talk. Uh, this is now about the solar orbiter first results. Um, I will think I will go a bit deeper into um, the paper that we had with uh, Emma Davis and the group um, at uh, Imperial College London, led by Tim Herbery, the PI of the magnetometer on solar orbiter. In on the left side here, you see the solar wind during that time that we could model with a. Uh, also very efficient method that we use in our group uh, that is called uh, THUX. Uh, I think it's called uh, tunable heliospheric upwind extrapolation. It's essentially, um, it uses the same inner boundary conditions as 3D MHD simulations. So there's this wang chi archi relation that you may have heard of, but then it uses uh, more simplified equations to uh, propagate the solar wind out into the heliosphere, and then you end up with uh, this Parker spiral uh, shape um, with alternating and um, slow and uh, fast wind streams, as you see on the left side. Uh, I've put also again here the spacecraft positions. And on the right side, you can see the rotation of the field. Uh, now it's a low orbiter, baby Colombo, and wind. Uh, you can see the a model, the uh, Hux model in, in this case. Uh, at Earth and at Orbiter as the dashed line here at the bottom. And you see that it matches quite well the ambient solar wind that has been observed by, by wind. Um, here, we could also now use those observations by stereo ahead, which you can see on the left side. So this move is a little bit fast and a little bit short. Um, but you, what you can see really, really well here is that the CME has a kind of special morphology. Uh, you can also see it in the in the in the upper uh, panels here. The CME has a really nice, um, clean-looking morphology, and this is exactly the morphology that we would expect if we would look um, what we call edge-on. So we would look along the axis of the toroidal tube, what the CME um, you know would look like in, in our model. Um, the really cool thing is here that, um, so essentially, again, what you here see is uh, density. So you see a kind of um, uh, elliptical shape that is uh, where the density is empty, and then you see a kind of shell wrapped around it. And we measured here when with the orange uh, crosses here, we measured the aspect ratio of that um, inner part, because we think we, we are pretty sure the inner part is exactly where the magnetic flux drop sits. And then the solar wind um, wraps around with higher density around this inner magnetic uh, flux drop. Uh, in the bottom here, you can also see, again, ensemble simulations where we derived um, the uh, distance and speed of the CME directly from those heliospheric images. So this is a, a method that has been developed by Tanja Amersdorfer in our group. And this, this is actually also the best uh, way or the, the, the most sophisticated model that has been 
uh, made so far with um, uh, based on heliospheric imager data. Um, we have been working now like 15 years on understanding um, these uh, on how to use these data and how to inter interpret them. And there is uh, still a lot of open questions. So these, these data are not that easy to use. Uh, but you can see here pretty well that um, uh, that those ensembles actually give, give a very consistent arrival time with what's then actually seen, seen at Earth. Now, this is another paper by, led by Johan Forstner from Kiel, uh, who has just finished his PhD. Um, what we've done here now is we fitted our 3D core model, the one that I showed before for the Parker probe double crossings. We fitted this to the solar orbiter magnetic field data. So I just stop this here. And if you look now into the solar orbiter plot, um, I just, yeah, I should probably explain a little bit uh, on magnetic field rotations in flux ropes. So, um, the BN component, would, so these are RTN coordinates, so radial tangential normal. Usually in flux ropes, the radial component is near zero or close to zero, and there is usually one bipolar component and one unipolar component. So in this case, uh, BN is just um, negative, and or BT is just negative, and BN is going from negative to positive. And this signature is usually explained since around 1990, where the first paper was in the 1988 paper by Bulaga, and then there was a 1990 paper by Lepping et al. Um, by a solution of the MHD equations that is known as the Lundquist solution. And um, there is also another uh, version of a flux rope that is called the Gordon Hoyle flux rope. They, they are differing a little bit on, on how they describe the magnetic field lines. Um, our model uses a uh, Gold Hoyle. Uh, cross sections and from these cross sections we then build up a, a kind of 3d flux rope um, we so we fitted this um to the solar orbiter data this model and you can see that the fit works really well and what we end up with is then um this kind of configuration so we get all kinds of parameters we get direction orientation twist and these kind of things. And the very nice thing here was um, that with the um, stereo head data, we could estimate that the uh, aspect ratio of the cross section of this flux rope should be around two. So we could already introduce this here. And um, so this is really showing how different kinds of data can constrain the flux rope parameters. Um, for Consistency, we then also checked, so you can see here that it just impacts solar orbiter. And then as it just uh, goes out of solar orbiter, then it goes into um, the near Earth solar wind data. So when we propagated this model that we fitted to solar orbiter towards Earth, then we saw that there is quite a bit of a time shift. So again, there is something that we probably are doing not quite right. Um, but with the multipoint data, we can understand what we're doing that's not quite right. Um, I think I just skipped that one. Um, but before I show um, how we try to alleviate this and how we try to make it better, um, the source of this CME is also very interesting from a space weather perspective. So there were two CMEs um, about five days before um, the Earth impact. So it was a really, really slow CME. And this is like now the new textbook example for what we call a stealth CME. Stealth CMEs are essentially giving us no sign in the solar corona or in the solar surface uh, or anywhere near the solar surface that a CME is happening. Um, you can see here two CMEs. So, so the one that's going to the right side is actually the one that's going toward Earth. Um, the other one is was going onto the backside. So this is not the same CME that you see from two perspectives, but there were really two simultaneous CMEs. So this is now SDO uh, image data uh, from EOV on the left side and it's continuogram on the right side. And you can look for a while at, this, at these uh, movies and images, but I'll promise you, you won't see anything uh, that, that is really digestive of, of a uh, flare or, or any other type of solar eruption or coronal wave or something like that. 
And so this is what we call stuff CME. We don't see anything in the corona. We just see uh, CME maybe in corona graphs. There is another paper that has been submitted by Jennifer O'Kane from MSSL. It's, I don't think this is an archive yet, but it's uh, close before, uh, before the revision is finished. So it's currently in revision, I think. And what she has done, she looked into um, if she if she could find something that is um, suggestive of a source region. And what she figured out is that, so this is now SDO here on the right side in the box. Um, a few days before the event where SDO saw the, uh, the, source, the putative source region of the CME on the limb, we could actually see this kind of cavity forming. And these cavities, they are known that they uh, should contain uh, magnetic flux ropes. And they can also form not, not only during flares, for instance, but also for a longer time uh, through uh, shorter living processes in, in the solar corona. Um, that's also interesting that that's, uh, so this is a model of the PFSS model of the solar global corona magnetic field. And you can see that everything was really flat here. So the this very current sheet is really um, in a in a low inclination, so the the, the sector structure is such that um, just the global field is one polarity in the south and one polarity in the north, and the boundary between that is very current. It is really flat, and that's also interesting for the reason um, that if you see here on the right side the CME going outwards, it's also suggestive of this um, morphology where we see the CME from, from its edge. So we see it's along the axis of the flux rope. And that's fully consistent with what we get here in the uh, magnetic field components and what also the, oops, sorry, I think. Yeah, sorry, okay. That should do it again. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yep, yep, yep. It okay. Is okay, because I've clicked something wrong, I think, and then I wasn't sure if you, if you can see. Okay. Um, now, this, this point is, I think, really important. So, because um, what we always want to figure out is if we see some kind of indicator in um, the images that will then actually tell us what kind of magnetic field is impacting the earth. And that is a really big unsolved problem because we don't really know, we don't have any other information on that really. We, we can, if we, there are some rules if we have uh, active regions and flares, and if we look at like, uh, you know, the magnetic structure of that source region, there is some correlation to what we see later at earth, uh, which we might be able to use in order to forecast that, but this is also not, not really clear. We had a paper on this with uh, Erika Palmerio in 2018, where we figured that, okay, if, if we see the source region, which, which we don't really see here, but if we saw a source region, then we can say, okay, there is like a 50% chance that what we see later, if it impacts the spacecraft or Earth, for instance, that, that this is what we, what we can relate um, to each other. In the other 50%, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. So you would need very strong rotations um, of the whole thing or something like that. Um, so this is this is very interesting that for for self seam this is a self seam where we can say okay um, the global coronal uh, magnetic field shows us that this that the axis of that flux web should be in the solar equatorial plane so it, it should not be inclined um, the imaging data tell us that it uh, that it should be like that and then it really uh, arrives with such a low uh, inclination at Earth so that's um, always very interesting to have these kind of events, which maybe at some point we will be able to derive from the morphology or from the solution or from the global coronal magnetic field, how these magnetic field components uh, will look like if the, uh, if the CME impacts Earth. Uh, but that's really a, a huge unsolved problem in the field. Now, um, as I said, so if we make now a single fit to solar orbiter data, we run into a little bit of problems because we then 
if we then propagate it towards Earth, we see that, okay, the, the magnetic field components are still okay, but there's a shift in the timing. And so now what we try to do with our uh, method that is uh, described in the paper by our PhD student, Andreas Weiss. So he has one paper already in APJ supplement series where the 3D core model is described in uh, quite detail. And what, what he has done is he has uh, made it much more efficiently, com uh, computationally efficient, this model. And what he can do then is to make this uh, fitting algorithm, um, which uses a special type of Bayesian analysis. Um, but the cool thing now is, and that's really something that we could do for the first time, is that we not only fit our 3D core model or any flux rope model uh, to a single point in situ data set of this flux rope, but um, to all three of them simultaneously. And that's what his, uh, what the method that he introduced now newly really allowed for the first time. And so these are the results. So this is a now a, a simultaneously triple fit as we call it. So again, you see solar orbiter on, on the upper side and the Colombo in the middle and wind at the bottom. Uh, you can see that, this, that the model does not describe the observed magnetic fields really perfectly. So especially in solar orbiter radial component, you see there is something going on that's not totally included in the model. The other funny thing is that um, we had to exclude the first part here, which doesn't really have a rotating field, but um, more constant field in those two components. And this component, so the PT component is acting a little bit weird here. Um, so we figured um, that the magnetic field that we can describe with our model is just this part here. And what's happening here at the front could well be that um, during the four days of propagation of the CME from the sun to one EU, it just picks up a lot of, um, you know, solar wind magnetic fields and, and density. And this is what we call, call field line draping. Um, and this, this CME is actually propagating a little bit faster than the solar wind. So it also, it really has a shock wave in front of it. Um, but otherwise um, there's a high speed stream pushing from behind. So there is kind of compression from, from both sides. And so we would expect something like that to happen. But it was surprising to us that this was uh, actually quite a uh, long interval in front of that part that we could actually describe with our model. Um, but the neat thing is uh, here on the right side, um, we have overlaid the so single point fits from all those um, individual spacecraft with the triple point fit. And, the, and we see that it's actually quite consistent. Um, but the cool thing is that we, if we do the triple point fit, then we can also get the timing correct. And uh, so for this event, everything works relatively neatly. This is, this is a paper that's in preparation now for this a little bit special issue. Um, but then there was a second event where the longitudinal separation was much, much larger. Um, you can see again here, so low the data uh, on top, the configuration of this CME is, is more or less similar to the previous one. So the blue, the N component goes from minus to plus, but the BT component is now just positive. Now, uh, Depe Colombo and wind were about 30 and 35 degrees away from solar orbiter. Here, solar orbiter is pink and Earth is green and Depe Colombo is blue. And it's much more difficult to see here if there is a kind of field rotation. Um, that's something we actually really expect because um, it is known since a 1998 paper from Volker Bodma that if you, have if you see with one spacecraft, a magnetic flux rope, and if you are about 30 degrees away with the other one, then on average, you will probably see only what we call the flank of that flux rope, um, or you, would, you wouldn't see it at all. Um, for this event, we did expect that we see it because this is again, the gesture of a low inclination flux rope, this, this, field, this field rotation that we see here. And um, now we also tried to, to make these, uh, double and triple point fits. Um, now things are much, much uh, more unclear, I would say. Um, that's a bit difficult to see here. 
but essentially, so we made single point fits again. Um, if you look, for instance, at the, at the red one here, this would be the one for solar orbiter. But if we include, so this one uh, does not impact, again, baby Colombo and wind at the right time. Um, but if we make a triple point fit, this would be the black one here, um, which has a much, much larger aspect ratio here. Um, then you would get, again, uh, this kind of consistency. Uh, but for this event, it's much, much harder to do that just because the spatial separations are, are much larger. But that's exactly, these kinds of events are exactly what we need in order to see where the limitations of our model are. And you can say that our model can work. Um, we, can, we can fit it to all three events simultaneously, but um, the single point fits are actually quite off. So that's, that's really quite interesting. So we, we are really looking forward to many more events like that. And we've calculated that in the next five years or so, we should see quite a lot of these events. Um, because with five, space, five spacecraft flying around in the in heliosphere, um, we should get on the order of at least 50 of these kind of events. Um, it depends on also on the longitudinal separation. But if you say um, we want to have events where two spacecrafts uh, get impacted by a CME and the longitudinal separation should be less than 30 degrees longitude, then we should end up with at least 50, if not uh, up to 100 events. So this would be really, really interesting for the next two years. If you just look at separations of like five degrees or so, then you would end up with on the order of 10 or 20, 10, 10 or 20 events. Um, so this is now a a roundup of the capabilities of our 3D core model. We now have made the model in such a way um, also that we can, it, we can deform it uh, much more. So deforming those foot points would be very important if we really see those PSP double crossings with Parker Probe um, that we can then really deform the model better to, to, to fit the data and to see whether uh, we, can, we can fit it again and, and try to yeah, make it consistent with the data. The cool thing is, of course, also, so the fits um, up here I showed you, but the cool thing is that you can use this model um, just by putting in any parameters of the flux group that you want. And then you can produce, you can place a satel satellite at any point, and then you can produce these uh, magnetic field rotations. So in this case, this would be a high inclination flux rope. And with high inclination flux ropes, then the BZ or BN component would be unipolar. Um, in this case, it would point just northward. If in this case, the axial field would point southward, then we would have, for instance, the most, uh, uh, those CMEs which uh, elicit the most strong or the strongest geomagnetic storms. Um, but I won't go much into that, into that here now. This, this talk is really about, about multi-point modeling. What we can also do now is that we can make uh, synthetic hemispheric images. So in the future, we can also then directly compare it uh, directly compare our simulations or the fitting results with what we see in the hemispheric imagers. Um, so this is, yeah, just a, this has not been, so this is a comparison between how the model would look like in stereo ahead hemispheric, uh, hemispheric imager one. And on the left side, these are the real data. These are not optimized or anything at the moment, but um, it's just to show that there is a kind of general similarity in the morphology. Um, this is exactly what I talked about. So you will look along the axis and that's exactly what, what you would then see in the images. Of course, in, in reality, the flows around the CME are much more complicated. But our approach is that what we really need to understand, what we need to model also in order to forecast space weather at Earth are these kind of field rotations um, in, in the CME flux rope because these are the these give the coherent magnetic time series among the field time series that will then uh, lead to energy input into the magnetosphere. Um, then there was even another event uh, in June uh, 2020. So the solar orbiter magnetometer data are already online. Um, they go from April to I think December of 2020. Uh, there have been a few CMEs in those data sets, a lot of CIRs, of course, uh, but the plasma data have not been um, 
the coverage of the plasma data has not been so great so far because there were a little bit problems with the instrument. Um, but I think they're looking quite good at the moment. Um, I think I just skip this. This is just another another fit um, of an event where you see um, the solar orbiter has probably just um, seen the very flank of the CME. Um, but the problem with this event was that we didn't have another in situ spacecraft or an imager because it was like directed exactly um, on the backside from stereo A. So we didn't have good Hillsburg image coverage and all the other spacecraft were also different places. And then you really run into problems with interpreting things because then you, you don't really know if, uh, if what your fit is uh, showing you, if that's, if that's a really good result or not. Um, so I'm already at the conclusions now. Um, I think that with uh, the combination of all the data for all the spacecraft that I showed, um, which is also called, and I think it's quite neat, which is also called the uh, Heliophysics System Observatory, to which kind of gives you the impression that, yeah, you really have a combined observatory by combining all these missions, which then gives you uh, opportunities that far outweigh uh what each mission alone can give you and for cmes and for the general large-scale solar mm -hmm. wind that's exactly what you need because with a single point in situ spacecraft you're kind of lost you don't uh you can't constrain your models really well um then space weather forecasting in general while we're working mostly on geographic effects um it's expectedly it's expected to greatly improve with this data in the next two years and if you couple this to an uh, SCP model, so an energetic particle model, then this would be very interesting, of course, also for uh, manned missions like the Artemis program that's um, um, yeah, likely to go on in the next few years. Um, so we now have five spacecraft, which can do in situ and imaging, go to high latitudes, um, do close solar flybys. Um, our methods, I didn't really go into the methodology much, but our approach is in general not 3D MHD, but we have really hyper fast semi empirical models, which we think, or which is our assumption, that can capture enough of the uh, physics for forecasting um, CMEs and CIRs also in real time. And the, the cool thing with these um, type of simulations is that we can produce a lot of runs in a very short time. And then we can use different techniques, like, um, well, as I showed, this Bayesian fitting technique um, to yeah, to constrain much better our models because with 3D MHD uh, in, in general, the, the problem with uh, predicting space weather in general, I didn't really talk about this, is that if you have um, near the sun, it's, it's very much like Earth weather forecasting. Um, you have some initial conditions and if you evolve things away in time and space from that initial condition, uh, the errors just get larger and larger and larger. And with the sun, this is uh, very, very similarly true. Um, if, you, if you introduce just relatively tiny perturbations well within any observational limits in, for instance, a CME direction or a CME orientation, um, then the differences, um, what you get if you predict the uh, solar wind at the L1 point near Earth, uh, can be really, really big. Um, they can range between uh, no tuning storm at all or a really big tuning storm. And so I think the future is that we have a, as, as, as many real-time imaging and in-situ observatories uh, hanging around in the heliosphere, giving us real-time data. And then we need these kind of hyper-fast simulations to really constrain also in real-time um, how the solar wind and how CMEs look like. And this should then yeah, lead to updated forecasts of, uh, of the solar wind and this should then really give us um, more accurate solar wind predictions. Um, there are a lot of unsolved problems which, are really, which I kind of talked a little bit about, but I didn't uh, spell out kind of. Um, so the, a real big problem is the global seeming magnetic structure and shape. So if this toroidal kind of shape is really true, we, we have some hints that sometimes there is a lot of de deformation in that toroidal shape because we now really know since we have, this has become clear since a few years that CMEs really interact quite well with the background solar wind. So parts of the CME which are embedded in the high-speed stream will go out faster 
than those which are a little bit decelerated or more decelerated by, by a slow solar wind. Um, so this interaction, getting this interaction right with the background solar wind is, is definitely a big unsolved problem. Um, then how the same magnetic fields actually originate on the sun is a big problem. We know that actually the, the global coronal magnetic field is, seems to be more uh, important than for, for deciding the orientation of a CME than um, what the small, more small scale active region is, um, is, is telling us because uh, you know, solar physicists often look at um, active regions and the flares, and then they try to kind of model and derive everything from there. But we actually would need really global, um, really sophisticated global magnetic field models. So these PVSS models that we mostly use, they are of course also quite a rough approximation at some point. Uh, and this should then really lead into a real-time um, BZ prediction, and that's that's like the the main unsolved problem when it comes down to uh, space weather prediction at Earth. Um, I just wanted also to say, if you're interested in using any of these models, um, most of them are the ambient solar wind, not at the moment, but uh, the 3D core model is on GitHub. And we have a Google Colab notebooks where with a few lines you can produce uh, the model and its outputs and you can just yeah, try to if you need some, something like that, then you can just uh, try to play with it. Um, otherwise, we're also working on uh, um, mapping those solar wind forecasts, like from, if you, if you have an L1 solar wind, that you map it to geomagnetically induced currents, which is of course a bit more of a local national problem because every, uh, every country has different, uh, um, yeah, you know, types of power grids and um, different geological features. And that's usually something that every country does for itself. Uh, but we can also uh, derive DSD, for instance, directly from uh, uh, solar wind time series, which is quite a difficult problem, actually. Uh, and for these, for optimizing these kinds of, I haven't talked about also this, uh, for optimizing really the the models with the data that we have. So I showed the result from this approximate Bayesian computation algorithm, but we have recently also used a lot of machine learning, uh, not so much neural networks, but uh, like gradient boost regressors, which then also, yeah, gave us a very good um, hint on, on how we can optimize uh, observations and, and, state and uh, simulations that we have. Um, I just wanted to show this. So this, there is a at astronomy and astrophysics there is a special issue on solar orbiter first results. Um, there are a few papers. I think about one week or ago um, there were five papers online. Um, what we also have is a solar orbiter institute working group on CME, CIRs, heliospheric current sheet, and large scale structure in general. Uh, this is led by Silvia Perry, me, and Heli Hietarda. Um, if you want to follow these uh, meetings, they are happening every five weeks usually. Um, there are usually two or three speakers. It takes one hour, and there's yeah, a lot of discussion about recent solar orbiter science. Uh, you can just write me an email or uh, contact me via Twitter, for instance. And we have this website called uh, helioforecast.space. Um, where we put out um, um, a lot of stuff that could be interesting to other researchers. So we have an experimental real-time forecast, um, but we also have a, a catalog of interplanetary common message actions. So I can show you this, um, I think it's best to show you this live on the website. Uh, I've seen I've already talked a little bit long. <laughs> uh, but I'll just show you this one and then I'll stop. Um, so we have here uh, on the forecast solar wind. So this is an experimental solar wind forecast. This is like kind of a, a simple model at the moment because it's uh, either using data from stereo A or from uh, the previous solar rotation. So we have magnetic fields, speeds, density, uh, DSD, and this, this is uh, aurora energy input. And you can see, so in the next few days, there should be a high-speed stream arriving. 
And under data, we have um, an ICME catalog, which has over seven, uh, almost 770 events. And um, this is a kind of aggregate catalog from several ones. And we also added our, our own events and we try to update this. So we, we try to keep this really as a live uh, catalog. So if you want to use any of this, you, you're free to use it. Um, it's probably best if you ask me if you yeah, want to know some details. Okay. So I'll stop here and uh, if you have questions, then please go ahead. Yeah. All right, thanks a lot, Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, we are yeah. now open for discussion. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Christian. Very nice talk and it had so many interesting details. Um, we can spend uh, hours talking about this. Uh, but I pick you up on uh, one last uh, point you made about the sensitivity uh, to initial conditions, uh, you yes. did uh, say that. And it seems to me you allow for this uh, um, from one realization to another, uh, which uh, gives you reorientations of these flux tubes somehow, isn't that right? Um, yes, we can. Yeah. The, this... the goal is to, to change all the parameters within reasonable. Yeah, uh, so I limits. understand that. Yeah. Uh, what I don't understand is why the flux tubes remain uh, intact like that for so long. And even as they travel in space for such a long distance, what kind of thing uh, keeps them uh, stabilized? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's known from observations that um, you don't really expect that they would dissolve completely. I mean, there is there is reconnect. No, we but know I'm asking, why do they remain yeah. stable like that? Um, just a curiosity question. Well, Essentially, it's it's stable? it's uh, magnetic flux ropes. How they um, how they um, how to say? Um, you know, they have a magnetic pressure. They have this uh, internal magnetic field. Um, which I think it would have to have look up a plasma physics book again <laughs> to, yeah, to okay. probably um, to probably answer that. But um, the magnetic uh, field okay. itself in, in the magnetic flux group is a kind of stable entity. So you can you can yeah, get okay. stable solutions. So, yeah. Uh, right. yeah. In, okay. in magnetic hydrostatics. Yeah. yeah. Um, you had a graph of a number of CMEs per year or something like that somewhere, uh, right? You, you um, had a graph where the number of CMEs is a function of something or the other. Um, uh, yeah, the, the prediction I showed, yeah. Yeah, um, I think you had a band and you within the band there were several uh, dots. Um, you mean this one? Yeah, that, that's the one, yeah, the one on the right, the small one. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. small one is just the, the linear correlation between sunspot number in the x-axis and the ICME rate uh, given by the Richardson and Kane lists uh, on, okay. oh, on the y axis. Yeah. Okay. So, All right. thank you. There I'll, is, there uh, is a monopolize. Yeah. I will let okay. others talk, but, um, but yeah, there are many interesting questions from your talk. Yeah. Uh, please Anything raise more? your hand or type it out if you have any questions. Yeah, I don't see any questions so far. There's one on chat, um, which is yours. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, maybe as others are typing in their chats, um, obviously the CMEs are not uniformly distributed on the sun's surface, right? Uh, there are preferred positions on the sun where they arise. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's given by butterfly diagram, essentially. Right, yeah. yeah. So could you convert your data to something like um, in the preferred region, number of CMEs uh, per solid angle or something like that? I and mean, that may be uh, most interesting. You know what I'm saying? Instead of giving um, a whole number. You have to be more perfect. specific. Uh, well, you mean you mean for the for the prediction of the CV yeah, for, rate or or like yeah, yeah just to know how 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 many there are in a given solid angle solid angle is four pi so um, yeah yeah um, I take yeah what I've shown here solid angle it's yeah, yeah, I think four I, pi I know what you mean. Mean. yeah yeah the the uh, the thing yeah. here is that so I predicted really the in situ CME rate 
Um, so these are two different things, of course. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, so in our paper, in our 2020 paper, we related the in-situ CME rate that's really um, observed at Earth, for instance, um, mm -hmm. yes. to the sunspot number. Um, what you mean is the general CME rate on the sun, which is, of course, much, much higher because um, uh, I think it's at least a factor of 10 higher or so. Mm -hmm. Um, because in solar maximum, there are usually a few CMEs per day, and it's every six days at uh, at oh, Earth. Okay, okay. Um, so we didn't I calculate think, that because yeah. we really looked at specific how many CMEs uh, hit in situ targets like okay. spacecraft. All yeah. right. No, I think it gives me some idea um, of what I the way I want to think about but, it. But yeah. yeah, but there are um, so people at Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in the UK. So they, um, uh, the PIs of the uh, heliospheric imager instruments on stereo, and they had a few recent papers out on general CME statistics that, that were have been seen with uh, heliospheric imagers. Okay. Um, you might want to look into that. It's uh, Barnes et al. Uh, 2020, I'm also co-author on that. Okay. Um, and right. there, there you see the general rise and fall of the, the general CME rate with, with solar cycle. Um, but it's 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 in general it's a good question because I mean um, how this is all related, um, it's also yeah. not totally clear because um, so there have been papers by Gopal Swami who showed that during the last solar cycle, um, the CME rate at Earth has been a little bit less um, as expected, and that's because um, the slow solar wind has been like opening up a little bit further. So the, the fast streams at the poles um, were kind of a little bit more like this and not like that. And mm -hmm. so the CMEs would not have been um, deflected so much towards the ecliptic. And then you would also give get uh, less CMEs uh, at Earth. Uh, but this is also connected to the global coronal field. Uh, yeah, during and how it how it acts during a solar cycle and this is a little bit different for low magnetic, magnetic activity cycles um, to higher activity activity cycles there are differences uh, in these kind of things so yeah. but this relationship how many cmes you get on the sun and then how it really impacts um yes. all the planets is not totally totally clear but there there are some kind of indications like that yeah. as scopar swami had all showed yeah um, going back to the flux uh, ropes um, what determines their um, orientation? Um, uh, not just the initial condition, obviously, right? Something does change their orientation. No, it's 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 funny. It's a kind of it. It has to be a kind of interplay between um, the active region, yes, um, and the configuration of that one and the global coronal magnetic field. And how that exactly works is is not known. Okay. Um, but there are papers from uh, Yoshishin at all, uh, Yoshishin single author, 2008, and he had a, a few papers before that, where he showed that if you correlate like in situ orientation with what you see on the sun, then the global coronal magnetic field, or what is then essentially the, the heliosphere current sheet, so what is then known as the global coronal neutral line, so the, like the orientation of the heliosphere current sheet is uh, a better indicator of the flux rope orientation than um, these more local uh, in situ or uh, these more local orientations of the active region. Mm -hmm. So the active region usually can you can active region you can also like draw either an S shape or if you like interpolate this you can draw like a neutral line. And this usually has some orientation which is also like um, consistent with like Hale and Joyce laws and these these things. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. um, but if you if you match those orientations to um, what you see in situ at Earth, which is then really determining the geomagnetic effects, you get um, these. Sometimes it works, sometimes sometimes it doesn't work. And so we had this paper with uh, Erica, uh, led by Erica Palmerio at all, 2018, where we showed this that for 50% of the events, we we had a sample of 20 events because there are not not hundreds of events uh, where we exactly know okay this is what we see in the sun and then we can track it and this is what we see at Earth. But for those 20 events, we were really sure about that. And we could say, okay, for 50% of events, it kind of makes sense to relate what you see at one EU to what you see in the active region. Um, but for other events, you would have to have very strong rotations, for instance, yeah, rotations yeah. that are sometimes too strong. Yeah. But yeah. Um, er erupting flux group models usually have um, those rotations to some degree. 
yeah. Um, yeah. but they usually say, okay, 90 degree rotation is okay, but um, probably not like 270 or something like that. And then it's, it's a little bit weird how those uh, events yeah. work yeah. out. Okay, all right. Yeah, thanks. I should uh, stop. No, no problem. Oh. Anything okay, else? If, if there are no more questions, then let us thank Chris again. Chris, thanks a lot. That was a great talk. Thank you. And we thank will, you. Uh, thanks for the invite. Uh, upload yeah, it on you. YouTube. And uh, okay. yeah, I look forward to uh, seeing your catalog and uh, yeah, look forward to seeing more results from your group. Yeah, if you're interested in using the catalog, so I mean, it's um, if you use it for a paper, it's usually good to, to uh, notify us. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you can do what you want with it. So sure, it doesn't, sure. doesn't matter. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Thank okay, you. Bye-bye. Okay, good. Yeah. Bye. Bye.